And um, this is being recorded as you know, it's part of the Economy and Society uh, virtual lecture series replacing the summer school with this new virtual world. Uh, we're very pleased uh, today, delighted to welcome uh, Mitchell Dean, um, Professor Mitchell Dean. I'm not going to do a whole introduction, but today he's going to talk to us about um, um, the ec economic theologies of, of, of governmentality and, and, and some other interconnected uh, topics. As, as, as per advertisement, um, Mitchell has a new book coming out, which is the provocative title of The Last Man Takes uh, LSD with Daniel Zamora, which is coming out, I think, in May or June or something this summer. So it's definitely beach reading, I, 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 I think, because of that, that great combination of scandal and scholarship, you know. So um, it, it's, it's really one for your uh, list. So have we a screen to share, Marie, just uh, yeah. uh, to take the uh, all the face to face away. And um, Mitchell, we've got a lot to talk about. So um, would you just like to introduce the sort of the, 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 the broad uh, direction of your, uh, your talk today? Yes, thanks, Tom. And hello, everybody. Good morning from, from a relatively miserable Copenhagen, I have to say, today. Um, someone joked that yesterday was the last day of spring and today is the first day of autumn. And, uh, but um, it's, thank you for, for your interest and for, and for coming and, and it's great. I think one of the great benefits of COVID and everything is this kind of, this allows us to have these Zoom connections and uh, given my other obligations at the moment, it would be very hard for me to, to, to get to Ireland in order to do this talk. So I'm, I'm really pleased to be doing it. I'm really pleased to be continuing the contact with people like Tom and, and Ray. Uh, so, so thank you very much for the, for the invitation. Let me, um, I, didn't see the, I didn't see the picture of the book. It didn't come up. Oh, that's fitting. Um, um, we'll, we'll fix that momentarily, I think. I think we should <laughs> fix this. You have a great line in it in which you talk about Foucault and Agamben and our, our shared problematic pervasive and disabling contemporary anti-statism. So uh, <laughs> a, a quote from the book instead of a picture to start off with. Where should we, where should we take that? <laughs> so that's what I, I am going to start with. I'll, I'll say a few words and hopefully it's only 10 minutes at the most. Um, and that's really that I, that, um, that, you know, start with the idea that Foucault in a sense, inaugurated a kind of intellectual endeavor anchored in the present. Um, but my question is really, what does Foucault say to us about our present? And, and perhaps above all this kind of extended period of lockdowns, we seem to, I think we're in the first anniversary of it here in Copenhagen at the moment. Um, so his present isn't our present and and it seems to me that this strange, this really good scholarship on Foucault and what he said and how many books he wrote and how many lectures he gave. And it's an endless stream. Um, I think he once made a joke about one day they'll publish Nietzsche's laundry lists. Well, I think we're getting close to the laundry list level with Foucault. And, uh, and, uh, but there's very little written about his context. For someone who didn't believe in universals, but spoke into a particular context, there's very little that uh, written about that. And I think that was what, uh, that's what the last man takes LSD, Foucault and the end of revolution, is this, is this subtitle, um, is trying to in some way address. Um, but what would he say about the present? And, you know, you probably have two Foucaults. You have a nice polite uh, sort of 18th century civil society, Lockean kind of, you know, English governmentality school kind of Foucault, who would say, who would urge us to, in a very value neutral way, to analyze the liberal techniques and rationalities, modes of subjectification of the government of the pandemic. And that would be one. one. Then there would be the more radical Foucault, of his lectures of society must be defended, history of sexuality, volume one, who sees 
would see this as the creeping expansion of biopolitics, a delirious combination with sovereignty, particularly in, at work in um, the formation of state socialism and even national socialism. So there's a critique of totalitarianism there. Um, the restrictions of the pandemic would recall the disciplinary procedures first introduced in the 16th and 17th centuries in Europe against the plague. And um, we would be witnessing the ascendancy of biopolitics everywhere. Even though he spoke very little about biopolitics, we managed to see it everywhere in, in, and uh, extending its techniques of surveillance. And in a sense, Agamben is the heir to the second Foucault rather than the first Foucault. And, and he, uh, in a sense, articulates the Foucauldian problematic of biopolitics, sanitary politics, politics of death, its dark side, that through the prism of the Schmittian, through Carl Schmitt, state of exception and state of emergency. So what I'm saying here is very impressionistic. It's very, um, it, I'm not putting this in an exact way or a formal way, but, for, but we could say again, but is the heir to this radical Foucault. He's much more, of course. So his diagnosis of the present is about the way the governments are using the pandemic to extend and make permanent a condition of emergency. And if one follows his blog, one sees his own uh, occasionalist the theological analogy in which medicine and medicalization has become the new religion. Uh, but I, su I suppose disconcertingly, the, um, this kind of critique means that perhaps one of our most significant lines of critical theory, if they're not in bed with, are at least in the same house, if not in the bedroom, with some strange allies who would be anti-maskers, Trump-style populists, conspiracy theorists, anti-vaxxers, and so on. So that, that leads me to, to want to, to, to say it's important to think about how we think and about how we analyze and what other paradigms or, and analytical strategies we employ in our research and for PhDs, I think. This is a really crucial question, is what kind of paradigm are you employing? What kind of analytical strategy are you using? And it would be important not to conflate an analytical strategy with the person who might be identified with initiating it. So you'll probably see today or hear today that while I have taken quite a bit from both of those thinkers, I, I have quite strong kind of critiques of, of, their own, of their own operationalization of these things. So, so in the 1970s, as you know, and I don't need to go into it, Foucault started talking about governmentality in his lectures, but it be, took a long time to become a paradigm. It took a, a long time to become, in a sense, a, a, an analytical strategy, and, and, and it did, a successful one, and you know, one that, um, one hopes that one made some contribution to. 40 years later with, and I think when I first read it, uh, the book, The Kingdom and the Glory, I think it marks a, it, in a way, a, a break or a threshold to a new kind of paradigm, which he called economic theology. And he did so through, uh, on the, at least on the one hand, this more or less effective critique of governmentality. Um, he also compared this paradigm to, a, to a, a longer term one of political theology and put it in a kind of, uh, in, in a kind of tension and a relationship with political theology. So in this sense, it is still in the process of becoming an analytical strategy. The, 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 the movement from um, a set of ideas articulated, exemplified in some way um, uh, as a paradigm, as an example that one can follow uh, um, to an analytical strategy is a, is a longer path. And I think that's going, there are people here today, um, Stefan, Ray, Tom, 
who have contributed to the development of this as, an, as, a, as not only a, 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 an interesting perspective, but as a way of thinking, as a, a way of thinking um, much more systematically. So, to, so I wanted to say to apply a paradigm is not simply to re reproduce it, but it's to innovate within it. That's the whole, that's the whole kind of basis of the idea of a paradigm. Um, so I think it's possible to inaugurate a paradigm, but not be fully aware of the implications of what you've inaugurated. And I would put a gambit in that, um, in, in that uh, category. But so I've just, I have a, num a lot of other I, uh, thoughts. I've been putting some notes down this morning. Um, but we could, you know, we could have questions around methods and of governmentality and, and economic theology. I, as Tom knows, I've been interested in forms of confession of the of the ordeal from Foucault, ideas of liturgy. Um, I'd be interested in talking about or thinking about the political valence of a kind of both an economic theology and a political theology. I'd be happy to think a little bit more or try to think a little bit more about the COVID situation, the restriction, the pandemic restrictions and so on, and how we might move beyond this kind of uh, biopolitical critique uh, of it as a kind of form of authoritarian state uh, surveillance. Um, then we, and then I, can, and I could say a little bit about the last, the last man takes LSD through Co and the end of revolution. Um, as well. So th I think that's, th that's my introduction. Um. Hi, uh, can I, Mitchell, I mean, as people are gathering their questions just to, to, to connect, because we had a very stimulating discussion on Tuesday with Stefan about economic theology um, and, and, you know, what counted as economic theology and what was simply um, overkill or, 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 or drawing really uh, a over extensive parallel. So, um, and, and then the question came up of, of how to do this kind of research because that that sort of that sort of um, Foucauldian style analysis of the present is, is relatively easy. But these these things of the actual um, difficulties of history or the economic theology questions of method. How, how can one how can one do an economic theology or do a genealogy? without a superhuman amount of reading and what and how can you distinguish these things the RK and the signature or you're particularly in, a, in another book talk about signatures um could you just say a little it's just it's, it's just something we came up with yet, yet on Tuesday and really didn't quite resolve how 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 much how how, how to how to go about this method how to think in this way could, so if you just I'm just jumping in as the chair first before others please Anyone put your hand up or, or, or stick a question into the chat box and we'll direct Mitchell to the areas which most interest people, of course, um, but just as an initial question. Yeah, and, it's a, and I think it's a question that, um, that's not easy to answer because, as I say, I think it, as an analytical strategy, it is something that's still in formation. It's not possible to write a, it's not possible to write a textbook about economic theology at the moment. Um, but my own approach is to, try to, is, tr is to try to approach it as an analytical strategy and to try to make some sort of fundamental distinctions and, some, and, 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 and define some of these concepts. So the first, um, so the, you, where should I start? I mean, the first one, the first point that I start is to say, that I think you could have a uh, distinguish between a conceptual political theology and an institutional one. And then I would go back to um, uh, uh, Carl Schmitt's um, book on uh, political theology. And he talks about a kind of systematic relationship um, between uh, theological concepts and juridical concepts. So this, so, from the beginning, I think there is some idea that as we see the movement of concepts from one domain to another, 
and yes, it may well require quite a quite a lot of prior reading and and and, and research about the theological one. Um, that there is a that the first uh, moment of rigor would be to talk about some kind of systematic movement of concepts from one do domain to another. And I'll come back to that with um, the idea of, of signature in a moment. On the other hand, Schmidt was also interested in the way in which the kind of um, the, the, the development of the church uh, occurred, the way in which we had the Reformation and uh, the conf conflicts between Catholicism and Protestantism. But he was also, also interested out how out of that history, the emergence of the modern state appeared. So, this, so as well as there being a conceptual uh, economic theology, I would want to say that there's an institutional economic theology and that if we, uh, uh, so that's a, a kind of first distinction. And that may be a, an answer to the, a little bit of an answer to the question of, you know, how do you start one of these things? How do you start thinking in either of those ways? Is that you have to look at previous analysis. So if you want to start an institutional economic theology, maybe you should look at Weber, Weber's Protestant ethic and think about faith of Protestant ethic. Maybe you should start from a critical position in relationship to Foucault's genealogy of the pastorate and so on. So that, that's, that, that's the first distinction I wanted to make. The second one would be, the second idea would be to talk a little bit about the signature. So the signature, it seems to me that the signature is something that marks concepts and places them within a particular domain. So it's something like a kind of key to a discourse, if you like, if we put it in very, very vulgar terms in a way, that it's a, that, um, that it's some, it might be a concept, it might be a word, it might be a phrase. To me, I, I find the phrase, God reigns but does not govern, really powerful and one that really allows me to articulate a framework around how sovereignty and governmentality might be thought of in, in a relationship. But it might be a gesture, the putting of the hand on the baby's forehead as the baby is baptized, or the putting of the hand on, a, on the Bible as you undertake an oath. These are things that place these statements and practices within a particular domain. And that if one wants to talk about the transfer from a theological domain to a, to a, a political one, a legal one, an economic one, then one needs to show, be able to show the kind of systematic ensemble of relationships that are being reproduced. It's not simply, oh, I can see the same idea, like this one single idea in one place and it's been transferred to another. It's a signature is about a kind of systematic pattern of relationships. So I think that this is where the kind of much more uh, rigor uh, come, comes into it. And, um, and we can, and so, you know, a uh, Gambon talks about iconomia as a as this kind of as this kind of signature and traces its movement from uh, the management of the household through uh, rhetoric into the idea of the Holy Trinity into the idea of modern government of the economy and market economy and so on that. Um, uh, it's what is moving is not simply, um, it's an entire way of thinking that's moving. Right? It's not simply that the word economy is being used in all of these contexts, but an entire set of presuppositions about how you should think. So one of the presuppositions, which is revealed, I think, but very well by Gambon's genealogy there, is a presupposition of imminence that everything can only be explained in its contingent relationships to other 
other local things. And that that's found in the market relationships, they're imminent relationships, there's no sovereign in the, in the market relationships. It's found in the idea of the Trinity, in which there's this kind of, it's this kind of uh, interaction between these different persons, heterogeneous persons that makes the unity of, 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 of God. Um, and it's found in post-structuralist thought, the dispositive. It's the, the most economic, <laughs> in that sense, form of, of, of logic. So I suspect that post-structuralism is theological. And that's, uh, <laughs> that's a way to make method powerful for meta-theoretical critique, all right. Uh, we're going to grasp the nettle, I think, of, of, of you know, there's always, it's always, I think it's always important to, to you know, start with the scandal in a way. Um, because I think we're all aware of this, or many of us are aware of this. Uh, R. Mead, uh, can I just invite you to, 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 to ask this question or if you want to expand on it? Um, um, hi, yeah, it's Rosie here. Um, hi, Mitchell. I was just interested in hearing a little bit more of your response um, to Agaben's, I suppose, reaction to the COVID-19 panic and his critique of, of the state response. Just what your own perspective on that might be. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Well, I haven't followed everything that Agamben's written, um, but I do occasionally drop into his blog and uh, find sort of interesting stuff there. Um, in fact, he, he seems to be one of the kind of key references he seems to be you know, recovering is Ivan Illich and this kind of critique of medicalization. Uh, so According to Agamben, I guess, how do we put it fairly bluntly, that these restrictions are the use of a crisis, the use of, of um, a state of exception in order to have further incursions of a kind of authoritarian state regulation of, in, of individuals and population. Um, and that uh, they come at the end of the time in which we've had the, uh, the previous set of incursions of a state of exception, which were the, the war, that was the kind of post 9-11 uh, war on terror. And now this is the uh, mobilization of, the, of, of medicalization. Medicine, I think I saw one post where he says, medicine is the new religion. So health and uh, keeping people alive and all of that becomes the new kind of salvation. So in, in some ways he's, it's quite, Unlike the rigor of a book like The Power and the Glory, when you read these more occasional pieces, and that's fine. I mean, I also like the idea that, you know, intellectuals can be public intellectuals and that you don't have to reproduce the entirety of your, you know, intellectual apparatus in order to intervene in a, in a, um, in a, uh, in a situation. But I would say that I think that, that, um, a Gambon um, strongly emphasizes the anti statist character of much of contemporary supposedly critical thought, the focus on the state, and the, and the anti sovereigntist character of that thought. So that's the, that's the first thing. So that the main problem becomes the authoritarian um, uh, intervention into our liberties, uh, the way we interact, uh, whether we can make gestures uh, with our faces and so on, uh, how we can move, that becomes the main, the main problem. So, his, so with both Foucault and Agamben, I would say, despite you know, all of the difficult language and all of that, the ultimate kind of problem um, in some ways comes down to a problem between authoritarianism and liberty that in fact that what the COVID situation requires us to think about is requires us to think about the social as somewhere different from from that kind of that that kind of relationship the hi history of the social the development of public health the, um, the specificity of public health knowledge the um, the way in which public health relies upon 
networks of, 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 of intervention, state intervention, but also local agencies in the test and trace isolation regimes and, and so on. But there's much more um, there to do with the history of social, social government, if you like, social democracy, than a question be, of, a, of a kind of conflict between our liberties and, uh, and the abuse of sovereign power. Um, so that's, that's one of the things I, I would want to say. The, other, the second thing I want to say, I guess, is um, that the current, if we start talking about power knowledge relationships, um, as far as COVID is concerned, it is much less a, um, a situation in which you have this kind of uh, enthronement of one particular knowledge, medical knowledge. And in fact, medical knowledge has been, uh, I would even say has become quite marginal to this whole, this whole moment. And that, um, and that there are plural forms of knowledge involved, some of which are marginalized, the knowledge of nurses, the knowledge of care workers, and so on, that's been marginalized in that, in that process. But the types of knowledge that are actually the ones that we should be, could be directing critique, however that's framed, would be you know, epidemiological knowledge, because that really is what is driven, that drove at least the first kind of um, phase of our uh, response to it. And, and epidemiological knowledge had a lot of modeling that was based on influenza and, and, and so on. And it gave rise to the idea of trying to get um, some degree of herd immunity throughout the, throughout the population. Public health knowledge, on the other hand, has been in contest, in a kind of contestation with that. And the public, and, and because from a public health perspective, the only way that we can return to normal is in a sense to eliminate uh, COVID from the population. And, that, and that's a totally different regime. So I just wanted to point to when people talk about, you know, either medicalization or something like that, that there are multiple forms of knowledge in contestation um, within this kind of COVID regime. Uh, and it, so um, in a more general sense, well, last point about, about this, in a more general sense, I think that what I really liked about the kingdom and the glory was that, a, that the critique of government, the critique of governmentality was about the reassertion of the idea that there are that all practices and forms of power rely constitute a kind of transcendent foundations and it and the the idea that you cannot dismiss the idea as many social scientists have theorists have and so on of sovereign sovereignty and sovereign power and that you need to understand the articulation of sovereign power with the kind of practical forms of government. And, but the problem with Agamben is that he's only ever seen the, in a sense, the nasty side of sovereign power. He doesn't see the way in which the state capacities based on the idea of taxation, based uh, on the idea of social provision and so on are actually enabling for forms of freedom and forms of uh, uh, forms of subjectivity and so on, and and I would say actually I would extend that critique also to Foucault, but and so in that sense he, he hasn't actually seen the dual character of sovereign of sovereignty and sovereign power, and therefore he can only see the COVID situation in terms of this authoritarian extension of surveillance. Mitchell, can I jump in just on, on that before we move to our next question, or I should really give Roisin Mead a chance to respond as well, but Malthus has came up actually uh, on Tuesday with, with, with Stefan and, and previously with, with uh, Elizabeth Anderson uh, last week. And I mean, you've written quite a bit about this and not, not, the, not the dark Malthus of, 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 of let the famine happen or something like that, but I mean, is, is there a degree to which this, the, the, this is all about the management of population not, not economics in a, in a sort of liberal sense, but a, a more of a, a targeting of the population and the COVID uh, 
uh, crisis makes us think about ourselves as a population. When you say this word herd immunity, you know, is, 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 is the long shadow of Malthus relevant again in, in the present? Certainly in some, in some respects, it's a, it's a good question. I haven't thought about it. In fact, um, in um, 1990, I published a book called The Constitution of Poverty, which had a substantial part about Malthus and his theodicy. Mm. And, and in a way, Malthus to me has always been the key of why I didn't believe a lot of these liberal narratives and hidden hand narratives and nice polite views of, of, of liberalism, because he, um, he showed that, uh, uh, you know, that the, he, he elaborated a model in which there was a, this whole kind of ontological scarcity at the base of human relationships to nature. And he, and so in, in a sense, it's something positive that he's given this kind of, you know, early socio-biological kind of uh, uh, framework. Um, and he and he definitely becomes he's becomes the paradigm that's taken up by economics and Ricardian theory and so on on the one hand and by Darwin on the other. So he's a kind of this he's at a, at what Agamben would have called a point of indistinction between economics and and uh, and biology, in which you. He's working in a space where the, you know you cannot make a distinction between those those two uh, disciplines, and I think he's in that sense he's really interesting. And yes, and I mean you hear in Sweden, for example, we hear, and I know I can see there might be some Swedish <laughs> colleagues present, but I've heard you know people say, well, you know, and it's not only in Sweden, but you know, in the name of this kind of herd immunity. But we'll all be better off in a hundred years' time, even if a few more of these old people die. This kind of this kind of suggestion, and uh, it it does, yeah, um, it does suggest that there's a kind of much more to me, much more powerful, uh, in a way, um, I don't know, biologistic dimension in and in. Um, in liberal economics. Can I ask Roisin, do you want Mead, do you want to come back in on that question of Agamben and the COVID or, or anybody else on the COVID before we move to Ida who had her hand up for maybe a, a different <laughs> no, question? I don't want to have a discussion at all. I just thought that was a really, really, really good response because it does seem to be a kind of a, a primary fixation on the authoritarian part of the state. And I think that is crucial to it. And, and even in a lot of the the strange bedfellows, the anti-maskers, there is also a similar impulse, isn't it? The excessive focus on the authoritarian and a kind of a denial of any kind of positive sociality or, and capacity for collective, you know, being together that isn't imposed externally. So, yeah, thank you. That was really useful. Um, maybe, and Ida Simonson, are you with us with a hand up? Yes, I am I'm with you. Thank you, Mr. It was uh, really, fascinating to listen to you and um, yes I'm I live in Sweden so <laughs> I live with this really crude <laughs> uh, let some people die off for now and we'll be better off later but it's not really I think that's a really a misrepresentation of the Swedish take on the COVID crisis uh, though it of course has a kernel of, of truth in it and I know it's uh, quite common and wrong uh, and it's worth thinking about the roots, of course, to a harsh and uh, Darwinist notion of, of human populations too. Anyway, I, I think that there's so much that, that I find really difficult and interesting and important in, in economic theology and the relation to political theology. That I don't really know where to start <laughs> my questions. Um, but I think maybe Maybe simply in the, the sort of opposition, or I think it, it's a Gambon who puts it that political theology and economic theology are both opposed and they are functionally related. So they're, they're like two paradigms that, that are defined in relation to one another and that work in relation to one another. And um, to me, that puts some 
questions of how to how to operational operationalize I might say in English uh, to to make those work in, in an analysis of the contemporary uh, society or like what is what is political theology and what what is economic theology so so um, if uh, economic um, governance or gov governmentality has a, a way of neutralizing the political. How are we then to understand the way that, for example, in the COVID crisis, uh, the political can shut down entire economies and keep them alive at the same time? So there is clearly a dimension of sovereign power in uh, this economic reality that is also understood as self-organizing in a sort of economic theology mode. And uh, yeah. I'm just at a loss. So I, that's my, I, I start there. <laughs> oh, there, I, I can see you now. It's very nice to see you. And um, I didn't mean to caricature um, Swedish discourse at all. So I apologize if I did. Um, the, I think you could, I mean, you could take them as kind of, diff, as, as, it's a difficult question to know where the distinction might lie between them, or even as I think Tom has spoken about a social theology. So it's probably, it's, it, and in fact, are the methods going to be different in, in these different spheres? Maybe one does need a kind of Weberian uh, idea of the kind of differentiation of different spheres of life, like different ways of life conduct in order to understand the movement from theology across to specific areas. Um, I, would, um, I would say that, so there's, there's sort of two questions that one wants to disentangle here. One's a kind of historical question. What's the relationship between economic theology and political theology historically? How did each of them arise? What are their connections with one another? And, I'm, and I take the counterintuitive um, position that economic theology is prior to political theology because when Schmidt was actually he, when he was writing he was actually writing against Weber or at least in relationship to Weber so in a kind of tension with Weber and so economic theology even though it appears to be a more recent paradigm that's emerged within uh, humanities and social sciences is in fact a precondition of, of Schmidt's political theology, so historically. So that's a history of ideas type of um, problem. But then thinking about these kind of relationships, um, maybe one way would be just to think of them as pol polarities within a field of relationships. That would be between, between political theology and economic theology. And that, that that there isn't a fundamental distinction, that they, they are in play in relationship to one another, just as the kind of monotheistic God and the Trinity are in play in relationship to one another. So that, that would be, and sovereignty and economic governing governance are in play in relationship to one another. So that would be my, sort of, I would say, we shouldn't be too strict in drawing a kind of lines and, 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 and distinctions between these and these kind of activities. But, um, but then the other question is when Agamben says these are two paradigms, what does he mean by the word paradigm? And he talks about paradigm as standing beside, taking a case that stands beside a set of cases that you take outside a set and that exemplifies that set. Um, and so the oikonomia exemplifies a set of ways of, uh, ways of thinking, of, of forms of practice, which is different um, from uh, a monotheistic God exemplifying a set of monarchs, sovereign states, etc. So that, so, so, in that strict sense of paradigm, um, a paradigm is simply an example that you take away from the other cases 
and you use it as the exemplar of a whole range of things. Can I ask a follow-up on that? That was exactly what my second question was, uh, or one of the billion questions. That uh, I, I find that definition of Gandhana paradigm really helpful, but I don't understand how to connect it to signature, because the oikonomia then would seem to be possible to take both as a signature and as a paradigm. And that brings me to the issue, how are these related as an analytical apparatus? And like how, how can I use them, the signature and the paradigm? I'm not sure I can answer the question of how they're related, but I think, um, And, and and the the I think there are in a way different, slightly different analytical strategies, maybe. But um, and that that the paradigm, in a way, might help a much more genealogical kind of analysis, where you follow you identify something as a paradigm and you follow the kind of uh, formation of it and transformation and tran translation of the paradigm. That would be one, that's one immediate thought. The other one would be, and, and the signature in that sense is much more about this set of systematic relationships. So it's much more like a kind of discursive practical structure rather than a systematic structure, rather than, an ex rather than an exemplar that one might follow the degree. I mean, if one, so we take our economy as a, as a paradigm, um, uh, then we can see, you know, identify it, see how it's, it, look at the innovations in that paradigm as it moves through various, spheres and historical moments, if you like. There's a kind of genealogy of that. If you look at it as a signature, then you have to think about what are the sets of relationships, what other concepts are in connection with it? How does it form a kind of systematic ensemble in a way? And, and what do we have to do to I, my claim, for example, that the Holy Trinity is the model of Foucault's dispositive. What do I have to prove <laughs> in order to show that <laughs> from a, as a signature, as a kind of signature, you know, that, that, that uh, uh, you know, and that would be suppositions of imminence, um, uh, interconnectedness of, of heterogeneous elements, etc., and that one could see that, uh, that, that transfer. Thank you. We're putting Mitchell through his paces here. Uh, <laughs> very, very good. Uh, Stefan, you're, 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 you're next. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I have a, um, a suggestion, but it's rather a question that brings the uh, brings us back to um, your earlier discussion of uh, of Agamben and his reaction to COVID nineteen, and also the 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 proposal that you make in in, in the book that was mentioned at the beginning. Um, and and the question that I'm having pertains to the to the usefulness or otherwise of, of the concept of neoliberalism as an analytical concept, as, so, as a concept that helps us explain the present. And the reason why I'm asking or so skeptical about this is that um, see, for, in the German perspective, the situation looks like this at the moment that uh, political parties that were typically associated with uh, neoliberal reforms, you know, the market above everybody, uh, let nature die, as long as everybody keeps working, everybody becomes a consumer and, and a useful worker. Um, those political parties have turned statist and become very protective of, of uh, and, and, and make sure that people stay at home and make sure that people don't go out shopping, etc. Whereas the populist left that used to be anti-neoliberal, 
is in Germany at least now the part that says let's open everybody let's let, let open the tills let people go shopping and go to bars and everything mm -hmm. and that reminded me a little bit of the turn in in the conservatives in the United Kingdom who during Brexit basically said fuck, fuck business so we have post Brexit post COVID-19 uh, political parties that typically stood for neoliberal policies who turned mm. completely anti-neoliberal and anti-neoliberal parties uh, that were pro-status being open to market, market opening. So does, does what we've seen the last couple of years spell an end, I'm now provocative, Have, are, we, are we peak neoliberalism as, a, as an analytical concept? <laughs> I did see the, a title of a book that said, was called The Last Neoliberal. And, it, and then I looked closely at it and it was about e Emmanuel Macron. Um, but uh, I definitely think that we're, I, I, I think it's a useful sort of genealogy to keep, keep alive. And because we've seen the kind of different phases of neoliberalism, haven't we? You know, from the Reagan, uh, Thatcher period through the through the Clinton, um, Tony Blair, third way kind of period. So it's it's morphed in in different ways before, and um, I suspect that that and and definitely we could talk about the way this crisis has caused realignments and 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 so on or has led to realignments and so on um but i've tried to i mean i in a way i try to uh, try to answer that question by saying that it's really be, that if neoliberalism does exist it's become kind of unmoored from from any from either those two the conservative or the or the or the labor party type uh, neoliberalisms the the roll back and roll out versions of neoliberalism and that you know you see neoliberal elements you, definitely in the Trump uh, anti-regulation, um, anti-environmental uh, uh, policies. So yeah, no, I, I, I've kind of I still think it's a it, I still think it's a genealogy that still ha has uh, an impact. I don't think it's the totality of the uh, of how we would diagnose the present, but I do come back often to um, the, the realignments that are happening on the left at the moment. And this is where I, I do think that there is a kind of uh, a way you could go from Foucault to Tony Blair to, to, the, to the current Democratic Party in the United States. And that would be through a notion of progressive neoliberalism that Nancy Fraser talks about, where you have a kind of uh, alignment of um, you know, anti-racism, um, uh, uh, anti-sexism, um, some would call identity politics with the most kind of progressive forms of capital, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, Hollywood. And that, that that's actually a kind of at least temporary formation that seems to be fairly significant in the present. And I think it has... And if we had to understand neoliberalism in a very complex way, we have to understand how from the time of Foucault onwards, the left became fascinated by neoliberalism and began to believe that there was no socialist way of governing and that a left way of governing would have to somehow borrow and innovate and use neoliberal uh, ideas. And, and uh, so in that sense, I would want to, I, probably why I want to keep the, the concept alive. It could be a very long discussion, but um, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll let Ray, Ray now in, and I know that some people may have to go at 10 o'clock, but if, if, if uh, more questions are, are, are very welcome. And just, sorry, Ray, before I get to you to correct on the slide, it says 10 o'clock next week, it's actually four o'clock, 16 o'clock next week. So. There's my bit of advertising over, and Ray, to your question. What an appalling advert there. <laughs> didn't even say was advertising. So um, that's Ilana's talk. Is it? Tom? Oh, right. yeah. Okay. It's going to be Ilana Gershon on job seeking the labour market, and it's going to be absolutely brilliant, you know? Uh, so. 
I find the inner market here in you. Like, I want to ask a much more uh, basic question and, um, and just the earlier part of your kind of presentation, you gave this really lovely description of uh, Foucault's um, journey um, and also with a few kind of pithy um, comments about Foucault studies and that, uh, that kind of business empire that has grown in academia around it. So you kind of, you separate these Lockean masterpiece studies where he's these kind of like incredible books, you know, fully rendered up theses that are like um, kind of iconic. And then you, you touch on late Foucault studies, which to me looks more like kind of Nietzschean scholarship, not in content, but just, you know, that we're dealing with fragments, uh, quotes, uh, transcriptions of lectures, and often it's little phrases that, you know, there's this big kind of exegesis of reading into and and kind of in, interpreting. And, and the curious role of intermediaries like, um, uh, um, uh, Francois Ewald and like all those kind of people. The neoliberal thesis, do you think it is fully there in Foucault or it's just something he was he was sensing? And maybe if you'd make some comments on that, I'd, I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the two theses that I would I mean, it, in, in some ways, it's, it's a, you know, I could say complexly overdetermined issue because, um, the, you know, that um, as the last man takes LSD, it makes plain there's this whole California Foucault as well. And there's this whole kind of, I, I would say that, uh, to be provocative, I would say that Foucault inaugurated a kind of thought style. Um, and rather than saying, rather than being a member of the neoliberal thought collective, he has a kind of thought style, a style of thought that ex enabled an exchange both ways between a kind of, you know, sunny uh, Californian uh, uh, countercultural kind of moment, and uh, you know, articulated at Berkeley in particular, and then you know, with people like um, Paul Rabineau. Uh, and so on uh, in, in beyond that, with the kind of French um, political reception of American ideas about neoliberalism. So that he, so that rather than saying he embraces neoliberalism or he's seduced by neoliberalism, he's definitely looking at it as something that the left could, could learn from. Um, and that it's, he, and he's particularly focusing on this whole idea of subjectivity. I mean, the, so, so um, someone I think said Foucault strategically endorsed, I think that's Michael Berendt, neoliberalism. So it's in the same way that we might say Anthony Ginn strategically endorsed neoliberalism or something like that. Intellectuals looking for means of, of governing, if you like. Um, but on another, in the other hand, he, really saw the neoliberal forms of regulation as an opportunity to break from all the pre-existing forms of power descended from the Catholic Church, the history of Western Christian culture, sovereignty, discipline, biopolitics, all of those things, because it was a soft form of intervention. It intervened on the environment rather than on the subjects the thing that he was most against became subjectification, forms of knowledge and power that subjectified. And here was something that only just acted on the environment, nudged as we would say, right? And, uh, and so he did find, and, and that it allowed, he saw the possibility of a kind of progressive neoliberalism that was inclusive, that was no longer based on sexual racial hierarchies or anything of that nature. That, and that, that was tolerant, the tolerated difference. And uh, so in, in that sense, I think he, um, but I, so I think that's this, it's a very, it's, it's a very interesting, you know, the, I, we speak in the book of the California Foucault, 
California, and there's a very specific set of references that the Californians took from Foucault. They took the subject in power and they found in there that, well, we still have exploitation, we still have domination, but now politics is really about the subject. And this, uh, and then it's no, so it's no accident that Foucault spends the next, last five years of his life giving lectures on techniques of the self in some ways. For me, there is a passage there, that's a late seventies passage, intellectual passage. Maybe it's a strategic endorsement. Maybe it's a kind of style of thought, but it's also an intellectual passage to where he, to where he ends up. Hmm. Um, I suppose I'd like to use a kind of Irish phrase about it. Do you think he, he lost the run of himself? <laughs> um, and is it, you're, it, it, it's a wilder than you're kind of presenting here. It's a bit wilder. I definitely think this, so the reason we called, I was in Australia a few years ago and I was reading when this book came out about, written by the guy who gave Foucault the LSD, Zabriskie Point. Zabriskie Point happens to be one of my favorite films by one of my favorite Italian film directors, Michelangelo Antonioni. Anyway, so I just had this idea of, you know, what a pivotal moment it is when Foucault, in a way, a bit buttoned down, starchy, um, French intellectual type, ends up going to this incredibly weird place and taking LSD and listening to Stockhausen and, and whatever. Um, and then he writes. And so when the book, we've actually put reproducing, this is a big ad for the book, everybody. We reproduced the letters that he wrote back We've actually done facsimiles of the letters, two key letters. And the first one is the one in which he says, this is the most, this is, I think he says among the most important experiences of my life, but it's clearly he's saying it's this sort of a life changing experience. And the second letter says, I've gone back and I've torn up hundreds and hundreds of pages of the history of sexuality and I'm starting to write it again. So, and don't forget that the history of sexuality is his major, this is his major life's work. This is what he was about to publish as the great opus of, of you know, the most significant mind in you know, the late 20th, in the mid 20th century in France or whatever. So I think there is a sense in which some of, There is a sense, I don't, but there's also, you know, but, but even given that, that is, we only take that moment to be a kind of paradigm as a kind of exemplar. It's not, so this is the moment that everything changed or anything like that, but it is, exemplifies this moment at, um, in which radical thinking was no longer concerned so much with domination and with, with um, organized forms of power, exploitation, class relations, the state and so on, but became more and more thinking that the personal is political, that politics is about your subjectivity and about self-transformation. And that's the most fundamental issue. And that's the thing he takes away from California. Can I jump into the conversation there, Ray, as I'm interrupting? <laughs> I mean, because it's what you know. It's the um, it's like it's like the the twin supposedly separate things of, of, of our our era. The main political concerns, or the main you know the, the things that come up at conferences and seminar rooms: neoliberalism and the culture wars and identity politics. And ordinarily, they're kind of you know they're dealt with over here. We have economics, um, state regulation, redistribution. You know, maybe serious and grey questions. And then over there somehow they're separate from each other and they're not at all in the account that you're giving um, are those questions of autonomy and freedom and desire and identity and uh, remaking, reinventing the self. So basically what, you, what you're sort of, I mean, Foucault's position, he's no saint or whatever. We, it, does, doesn't, it doesn't really, you know, it, the, how much does it signify 
what what kind of a guy was he or what kind of experiences he has but but what, what you, you are seeing or what you are suggesting here is there's a sort of confluence and a paradigmatic confluence in that moment of neoliberal economics and, and and identity politics and that i mean there's so many things on your list that we didn't get around to talking about today the confessional war or or, or, or the confessional culture war if you talk about or even um these constant ordeals of purifying the self to to, to make yourself better but what what you've um I, don't know. I suppose that that's kind of um the 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 knob of the question here it, it, is it is it that um is it Foucault or is it Foucault is an exemplar or a paradigm of our era that actually is joining these things, which are which are supposed to be separate uh, spheres, and, and and modding the politics from a politics of left and right to being now a, a politics of state and autonomy and individual. Yeah, and it's, I mean it is a it is a good question. I I don't want to over um, I wouldn't overemphasize his role in um, in all of this, but I would just say that he's clearly. I think we can all accept he was a very intelligent person who had a lot, who had the, in, uh, had the institutional conditions of extreme privilege for, for his own background was extremely privileged. Um, he uh, was able from a very early age to buy a, a very significant uh, piece of real estate in Paris that he could work from. He, uh, um, uh, he had you know, this most prestigious job where he didn't have to do much except uh, give these lectures. So he had plenty of time to reflect upon that moment. And I think he did, he, the, condi the conditions a lot, I think he, and which is to say that he had enormous individual capacity as well. And he did um, manage to capture in a very strange way that confluence that you're talking about between between this kind of entrepreneurial idea of the individual and this politics, which he sees as see, saw as a post sixty eight politics of everyday life, of the personal becoming political, of this, of, of self transformation, I think he did capture or he glimpsed it in some ways, and uh, and well before. Um, you know, people, other people on that would have positioned themselves on the left, for instance. But I, I, but I would want to say that Foucault was never a radical. That's, uh, I mean, if, as far as I know, he was never a radical thinker. Uh, he was anti, you know, he was definitely anti-communist. He's basically anti anti-socialist. He opposed the socialist government when they got into power. He was scared of the union with the left. He was very much always a kind of uh, and he was a part in the 70s of this French, as Michael Scott Christopherson says, it's an anti-totalitarian moment where, you know, the fear that any kind of, you know, of the state um, having inscribed within it a kind of potential totalitarianism. So he was always in the, so, you know, I don't, I think it's a kind of decontextualized Foucault. We imagine him as a kind of radical. And, and, and still very usable and very serviceable for whatever whatever we'd put him to as as, as, as the sanitized Foucault. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're nearing the end of, are, are there any more questions, hands or, or, or um, uh, in, in, into the chat? Um, you're very welcome. Um, but I've certainly had a thought provoking hour and I know that people have more more, more, more times and places to go to uh, during our daylight hours. So uh, I, it just falls to me, I suppose, to, uh, to, to thank Mitchell for discussing his work in a really ruminative and open way rather than presenting a whole, the, 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 the thesis uh, as, 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 as a show, because we live in a world of documentaries in which we constantly present finished products to people. And a nice ruminative conversation is, 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 is very refreshing. So thanks very much to Mitchell. And we'll see all of you next week, let's hope, or many of you, uh, on the uh, 16th at 1600 hours. But that's about it for me for now. So thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mel. That was brilliant.